All right, let's go to um, 2 Peter chapter 1. I just have a couple portions of scripture. 2 Peter chapter 1. For prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, familiar passage, I think. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done with how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto him, saying, let the gods do to me, and more so, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. And, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and, it came, and he came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, it's enough. I don't know if you've ever been there. I've had enough. Had enough. Oh, Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. And as he lay down and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Somebody say, Arise and eat. Arise and, eat. and he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink <laughs> and laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. Somebody say, Arise and eat. Arise and eat. He said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. I just want to talk to you just for a few minutes today. I think I'll call it get up and eat get up and eat. Just maybe push on three people. Tell them, get up and eat. Tell them, get up and eat. Get up and eat. Get up and eat. God bless you. You may be seated, everybody. God bless you. The, the main characters of the narrative of First Kings especially when we come to 17, throughout 18, 19, the main characters, three of them, are really archetypes. They're, they're really uh, more than the individuals and their names. They represent to us, they represent to us spiritual powers. The thing about reading the Bible is not just to know that it really did happen, but to know that it is still happening. So when I read it, I understand that, that these three figures, Ahab, Jezebel, and Elijah, are the main characters of the narrative, but they are so pronounced that they begin to represent for us throughout the ages spiritual powers and positions. And the, the, two, uh, the two that work together is the diabolical duo, the twins of destruction, Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab won't stand up, Jezebel won't sit down. Ahab won't speak up, she won't shut up. Ahab abdicates, she subjugates. They, they, they the twin diabolical duo of power. Ahab kind of fades over time into obscurity, even though we still know what he represents. Represents to us those who are put in a position of power and responsibility, but abdicate their place and their role. We know that. But he kind of disappears on us over time. Jezebel lives forever in infamy. She is mentioned throughout Scripture all the way in the book of Revelation. They're still talking about the spirit of Jezebel. Elijah embodies to us the spirit of Elijah. The spirit of Elijah is mentioned to us, of course, in Malachi, where he turns the hearts 
of the fathers to the children, children to the fathers. He's mentioned in every one of the gospels, the spirit of Elijah or Elijah. He is on the mountain of transfiguration with Moses and potentially is one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. They represent to us spirits, is what I'm trying to tell you, that live on because they tell us about something that not just did happen, but is still happening. At every time in every generation, there comes moments, pivotal moments, tipping points at the convergence of events by which decisions are made that affect the fabric and the environment upon which the next generation will enter into. You and I are at such a convergence of events and seasons and times in the world in which we are in right here and right now. That we are in a moment by which what we are doing, what we are saying, who we are being, will determine whether the generation coming after us will rejoice in our victories or spend their life rebuilding what we failed to do. Somebody say, I hear you. I hear you. This, is, this is interesting because we have these epic moments that are shifting times and events that become ages by which groups of people move through. We have the age of enlightenment. We have the industrial age. The 60s ended with Woodstock announcing the age of Aquarius. We have the information age. And I would suggest to you that we are now at a very pivotal moment and a very highly spiritually charged age, that we are entering into a season. Hear me when I tell you that we are entering into a season that the church must find its footing and find its voice to know how to insinuate itself into a highly spiritually charged age so that those who come behind us have an inheritance of the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm saying that on purpose because it's amazing that as the spirits of the age have become aggressive, the church has been talked into becoming passive. And it's a terrible thing to have an aggressive enemy and passive friends. I came today to say something because where we stand at this moment, I think is understanding that the church is the conscious of a generation and the church is to have a prophetic voice that does not come by the will of man, that does not move based on popular trends, but is moved by the Holy Ghost and is able to open up its mouth and speak truth into principalities and powers and tell them that Jesus is Lord. And for us to believe that no matter how good we become at all of the things that we become good at doing, and I'm for all of that, that we should become good and excellent at all that we do. But at the end of the day, it is not by might. It is not by power but it is by the Spirit of the Lord. If you believe me, take one minute and clap your hands if you will. Help me, guys. I say that because I don't know, I don't know what your viewpoint is or what your vantage point is and how you see the world around you. But having been in church all of my life and going to a lot of churches, I am noticing that at the time that we need churches to regain its prophetic unction more than ever, we have too many that are backing away from the call that God has given us in the earth. And God called the church, I believe, to be a visible, recognizable, material description of an invisible eternal kingdom. 
And therefore, we have to stand and we have to begin to proclaim. And, and I believe we are past time. We are past time. I'm sorry if I started preaching too hard, too early for y'all. And I know it's Sunday morning and all that, but I can't help it here. So just come on. Because the thing, the thing is, I think the time is past for our pastors just trying to be cool. I think we are past the time for the church just trying to be trendy. I think we are past time for motivational speeches and Sunday school lessons from the pulpit. I think it is time for the spirit of Elijah to stand up in our generation to stand up in our generation and begin to proclaim to the principalities and powers that we are not backing up because we are at a tipping point and the future depends on it. Somebody say hallelujah. If you guys can help me just a little bit and give me some sound on this, turn it up and all that. Praise the Lord. And um, I, th I think that we, we understand the understanding of age. We Mankind is, the, is unique amongst all the creatures that God has made because we're the only creature that studies itself. We're fascinated with ourselves, and when we, we want to know how we are and when we are, who we are, and why we're reflexive and responsive and why we act like we do and why is our spouse crazy and why our kids act like their mamas and everything. We do, we do all of that, and, and, and we're fascinated with it. But part of, part of what makes us who we are, thank you, part of what makes us who we are is when we are. Because we have generational differences. We even have birth order differences. We, we study all this stuff. How many firstborns are in this room? Okay, put your hands down. We don't like you. <laughs> That's for all your other siblings. All your other siblings been wanting to tell you for a long time, you ain't, you ain't a surrogate parent. Leave us alone. That's the firstborns. Directive and decisive and bossy and whatever. Ever, ever. How many, uh, <laughs> how, how many, uh, Last borns, baby, baby of the family. See, that's what I'm saying. That's how babies do. Woo, yeah, yeah. We know that. We know that because you're the favorite, yes. Because everybody else don't wore the parents down by the time you came around. They're too tired to whoop you like they whooped us. We will wore them all out. Broke every rule. They don't even care about rules no more. They're like, oh, whatever, whatever. You had them firstborns, you know, every time they fall over, you take them to the hospital. By the time the baby gets here, you back over him in a car and be like, get up, shake it off. Get out the way. Leave us alone. How many middle children are here? Come on, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Yes. Yes. That's a, I'm in solidarity. Yes. Power to the people. I'm in solidarity with you, middle. Thank you. I just did that because we need a little bit of recognition because, because the older ones... You know, they're the firstborn, they're awesome, and then the babies, but we just stuck somewhere in the middle. <laughs> and we have these differences, you know, with generations and stuff. I was, we were moving our offices a, uh, a few years back. We had some of the young people, apostle, coming to help us move the offices, and some of the teens were in there. And one of the teens walked up to me with, like, like this and said, what is this? I said, it's a Walkman. They said, what is a Walkman? I said, you put cassettes in it. They said, what is a cassette? I said, Google it. Every generation has a, a view and, 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 and its own crises and, and things like this. But, but I, I don't know, I don't know if, if the church as a whole has understood the, the intensity of the warfare against the emerging generation. So, you know, we divide ourselves, the boomers and the builders and the busters and the Xers and the wires and Zers. But there's the, those who are in high school, maybe early college age now, the, and those in really primary school through, and through high school, really are referred to now as doomers. They're referred to as doomers because they have a pessimistic worldview. They're the first generation that believes that their standard of living is going to be less than their parents. 
They believe that they will not inherit a good world to live in. They're referred to as the doomers. All of their movies, by the time they get done, you know, every, it's either zombies or vampires or robots or a, we always live in underground, running out of food. And everything projected to them is negative. Yeah. The negative viewpoint is that everything is failing them. They're going to run out of oxygen and water. The climate will fail them. Money's acting funny all over the world. The economic system is not set up for them to succeed. The criminal justice system is set to keep you in, not get you out. The medical system is not built to get you well, it's to keep you a patient. I'm going to leave after a bit. And the educational system is, is graduating people that that can't read or write properly. Amen. Systems are failing them. This is, I'm, I'm trying to help you see their view. And so they have adopted a philosophy of life that is referred to as absurdism. Absurdism has as its basic philosophy that the universe is without meaning, that nothing has meaning, that life doesn't have meaning, and therefore it is meaningless to try to find meaning where there is no meaning, therefore it is absurd. And anxiety is produced by trying to attach meaning to something where there is no meaning. It's absurdism. Therefore, when you detach everything from meaning and from God, you end up in a world by which you can't find your bearings. So things get so out of proportion until they can't find their way. So everything now is a mental health issue. Everything, like going to work. <laughs> now I, I need to put my disclaimer out here. We, 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 need to have, we need to have good mental health, and the church didn't talk about it for a long time, and I get all that. I get all that. But, but in, the, in the universe of absurdism, everything is a mental health issue. Anything that makes you feel any kind of pressure is not good for your mental health. It is your get-out-of-responsibility card for all things that you don't want to do. And you try to tell somebody, go mow the yard. That's not good for my mental health. <laughs> Get a job. That's not good. That, that produces anxiety. Okay, let me, let me. So the problem is in absurdism, things that are true mental issues are not able to be dealt with because you're so absurd as to call things that are not mental issues, mental issues. So we have to help them redefine that things like taking an SAT produces a normal amount of anxiety. That's why it's called a test. But it is not a mental health issue, nor does it require medication or you to be talked off a of jumping off a bridge because you got an SAT. You either going to do good, you're going to fail and take it again. Whatever. Get on with it. At the same time, with taking something like a test, getting a job, mowing the yard, waking up before noon, when, when those things are causing you anxiety and that's a mental health issue, at the same time, they're living in a culture that is rewarding and applauding true mental disturbances. Yes, yes. I'm going to preach it like I want to. It's a reason I got my flight out in the afternoon. I'm going to leave, and we got security, and I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out of here. Because what happens is that if, if you watch things like the Grammys, you see a parade of people who are not well. <laughs> These people are not well. I don't know why we can't say that. 
It was a parade of people who I was worried about. I'm watching the Grammys because I had friends that were at the Grammys. They were there for some kind of Christian something. I don't know. But I'm watching it, and it's, it is a parade of people who are not well. And they get awards. You're a six foot four man, glad because you beat women in a swimming contest. And we give you an award, and you're on a stage smiling. You're not well. You're not well. Something's off. Something's off. I don't have to go to school. I ain't got to watch Dr. Phil. I ain't got to hear Judge Judy. Nobody talk about it. I just, I, I got enough sister. There's something off here. Something off here. Part of emotional wellness is being happy with the maleness or femaleness with which God has created you. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm coming your way. Just hang on. Hang on. So, so when you are made to believe that taking a test is a sign and your anxiety is a sign of emotional disturbance, but men dressing like women is getting awards, you live in a world of absurdism. You live in a world of absurdism because we got these soccer moms that used to run around and you used to carry Gucci bags and poodles because that was your sign of being in and, you know, that was your little fashion statement. Now you show up with your boys in dresses because that's your sign of somehow being accepting and and that's, that's your new fashion thing. Not knowing this is not well. Something is off here, and you are not well, and they are not well. Address all of your emails to Apostle Don Mears at Evangel Temple slash Justin. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm stepping on this for a moment. I'm getting off of it. I feel your pain. I'm stepping on it for a moment to say that to me, it used to be the fact that if a church was prophetic, that it was the conscious of what was good and what was evil and what was supposed to be for the next generation rather than backing up while the world is collapsing around us and teaching silly life lessons that don't mean nothing. And whenever you become an Ahab and you abdicate raising your children, the state will step in. When we allow spirits of Jezebel and Ahab to over and dominate our generation, then they produce an absurdism of society that causes young men and young women not to know how to find any bearings. And then when they go to church, they're not hearing anything that is challenging them. But now God is saying it is time for those who have been founded in the foundation of understanding to realize at this moment Moment that we must recapture the understanding that holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I came to tell you on this 68th anniversary, might be a reason I was saved for last. I don't know. I'm not taking any offense at it. I feel like it's because it needs to be last. I don't know. But I came to remind Evangel that you have been born for these kind of days, that God strengthened you over time for these kind of days, and that you must know that your place in this territory is to be a prophetic voice and to declare the goodness of God in the face of principalities and powers and declare that you are not taking our next generation from us because there is the spirit of Elijah in the house. Somebody say yes. Come on, somebody say yes. Somebody clap your hands and make some noise and say yes in here. It is the spirit 
of Elijah. It's the spirit of Elijah. Elijah, Elijah comes walking in. I like it because he comes walking in without any announcement. We don't know that much about him. He just comes walking in. Now Elisha the Tishbite. That's how we're introduced to him. Now Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite said unto Ahab and Jezebel, it shall not rain till I say so. If, if you don't know anything else, you've got to love it about Elijah. He is not a joke. Elijah, Elijah will not get elected by a pulpit committee. Elijah is not your pal. He ain't your buddy. You should not, no, no. Wherever Elijah is, it's going to be some drama. He has, he's one of the most dramatic prophets of, the, of his time. Every place he goes is something happening. You should not hang out with Elijah if you need a hug every day. <laughs> you, you should not join Elijah's church if you're sensitive. <laughs> you should join a yoga group. You should buy a puppy. Take up finger painting. Something. But you should not hang out with Elijah unless you're ready for some drama. I, I, I'm trying to find a way to articulate to you that, that I think that we have reached this moment because for the last number of years, we have been under this misconception that our pastors can enter into church building by... Be, by making friends with the spirit of the age, by being controversy adverse, and by thinking that they can skip their way through it. Mm. When the truth is that we have now come to a point where we have to push away our fear, capture our faith, Find our voice and be willing to speak what God gives us and let the chips fall where they may. It's going to take more than people liking you on TikTok. It's going to take more than skinny jeans and white tennis shoes. It's going to take more than lights, cameras, and action. It's going to take the spirit of Elijah and the church finding its prophetic voice to move the needle. And this is Elijah. Elijah knows that for him to be who God called him to be, that true people of God are responsible to steward the spiritual environment over their territory. And Elijah walks straight up to Ahab and Jezebel and says, it shall not rain till I say so. That's a bad man any way you cut it. Ahab and Jezebel represent the powers. Why shall it not rain? It cannot rain because the lack of rain will cause the harvest not to come forward. If you have improper spiritual authorities over a territory and the harvest comes, the enemy will steal your harvest. So God has to withhold the harvest until the powers are displaced so that you can have the harvest that you're supposed to have. Elijah has a connection with heaven. It shall not rain till I say so. We have to have churches that understand that we are put here because we have a connection with heaven. That when we speak, heaven responds to what we speak. What we bind on earth is bound in heaven. What we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. It shall not rain. Let me just walk it out. Walk it out with, with me for just a minute because... Elijah goes from there, and you know the story that he goes to the brook called Cherith. God tells him, go, I've commanded ravens to sustain you there. And he goes to the brook called Cherith while all these other things are taking place. And there he is by the brook called Cherith, and the ravens bringing him bread and flesh in the morning. He's got room service coming to him. And if you, if you investigate it, you probably come to the conclusion that the ravens are probably taking food from Jezebel. That's the way I like to read it. If that's not right, don't mess me up because I'm loving it. Because 
because while everyone else starts going through hunger, Jezebel is feeding false prophets. The prophets of Baal, Astroth, all those who worship Molech, all of them, what is it, like 850 altogether, right? 401, 450 other. She's got enough food. Oh my goodness, I'm getting ready to say something. She's got enough food to feed everybody that refuses to confront her power. The culture in which we live will reward preachers and churches that don't challenge the culture. They'll make you out to be awesome, wonderful, accepting, whatever vocabulary they give to it. But if you have the spirit of Elijah, then they're going to leave you to yourself. But the spirit of Elijah, Elijah sitting by this river, this brook, and I believe that the ravens just flew on over to Jezebel's barbecue shack. Grab some ribs and flew him back over to Elijah. And Elijah is finding his flow by the river eating ribs. Then the brook dries up. When the brook dries up, you guys know all this, he goes to Zarephath. He goes to Zarephath. By the time he gets there now, the famine is this long. The famine has been in the land to the point that this woman in Zarephath is telling him, me and my son are getting ready to eat our last meal. I'm trying to give you a perspective on how long this has been going on. It's been going on long enough that they're going to eat their last meal and then we're going to die. Track with me now. Elijah is sustained from the ravens to get to Zarephath. He has to go to Zarephath because Zarephath is Jezebel's hometown. And if you're going to bring down the fruit of something, you got to go to the root of something. So Elijah goes to Jezebel's hometown and puts these two pictures at odds with each other. Because over here, you got Jezebel, who is rich. Over here, you got a widow woman who is poor. Yeah. Over here, you got a woman who is married. Over here, you got a woman who's a widow. Over here, you got a woman that is feeding false prophets, and over here you got a woman whose son is about to die for a lack of food. What, what the woman of Zarephath has that the spirit of Jezebel does not have is that the woman in Zarephath has a prophet. Yeah. And the Bible will tell us later that there were many widows in the land but only to one was the prophet sent. And the arrival of Elijah into that scenario begins to shift everything. If this woman will be able to give unto him what she has, it will give him the strength to go and bring down the fruit that came from that place and bring down that power. And you know the story. She feeds him. He prophesies, your mill barrel shall not run dry until the Lord your God sends rain upon the face of the earth. And on the strength of of that meal, he marches back to Ahab and Jezebel. Can I finish the message? Yes. And when he gets there, they gather all everyone together at Mount Carmel. And when they get to Mount Carmel, everybody's gathered there. And these are the words that Elijah says to all of the people who are gathered. Hear me when I say this to you. He says, how long? Will you be between two decisions? If God is God, 
then serve him. I feel like we need to be saying something out loud. How long are we going to be between two decisions, two opinions? If God is God, then why don't you serve him? If you know God to be God, if somebody preached to you and you used to serve God, then why don't you serve him? Because we are now at the point where your indecisiveness is costing you something. Your lack of decisions are costing you something. Elijah stands there. The prophets of Baal, prophets of the grove, they all get there. You know the story. They dance until the time of the evening sacrifice. They dance and sing and cutting themselves, wearing all kind of crazy clothes, doing all that kind of thing, acting like this generation. Every day is Halloween or something. I don't know what it is. And they're up there doing all that kind of thing, and nothing happens. I've been to that church. Nothing happens. Elijah prays the prayer. You know the story after the water goes on. Praise the prayer. I'm trying to move quickly. Praise the prayer. Fire comes down. This becomes the point. The next day, Jezebel sends word to him. I'm taking you out by this time tomorrow. And the same Elijah picks up and runs for his life. Can I preach it like I feel it? See, the thing is that, that we have had a generational movement of churches that were born in times of controversy and crisis that stood for signs and wonders and miracles that believe that there is one way to God and his name is Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. And preached the word of God in season and out of season and prayed and fasted and cast out devils and laid hands on the sick and not afraid to pray in tongues and prophesy and stay all night for prayer if we needed to. Generation of churches born in that kind of thing but somewhere along the way start getting tired. Start getting tired, and now Elijah, the same one that pronounced it, and the same one that called fire down, is the same one that is running for his life. And now he's sitting under a juniper tree, telling God, I have had enough. Enough. You can leave me out here by myself if you want to, but I prayed that prayer. I don't even know if it's a prayer. It's just a statement. You're going to leave me out here. I see you. I think that you have been to that place where you told God, I have had enough. And he sits under a juniper tree and he says, I just want to die. I just I ain't got there, but, but he's like, I, I just want to die. I, I told my church, I am not suicidal. Homicidal, yes. Suicidal, no. I might take somebody else out, but I ain't going out. No, it ain't me. You ain't got to worry about me. And he gets under this juniper tree, and he wants to die. I, I, I see something interesting about this, that the most often used word that I heard over the next, last few years in talking with pastors was this word, exhausted. I'm not talking about sleepy. I'm talking about exhausted. The thing about spiritual warfare is that it's exhausting. Yeah. Um, the, th the trick of the enemy is to wear you down so he can knock you out. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I know you're blessed, highly favored. I know you got the Holy Ghost that don't take nothing out of you, but it's exhausting. And when you have warfare on the left, warfare on the right, warfare in the morning, warfare in the new time, warfare when the sun goes down, you got all this warfare going on, and it becomes exhausting. When, when pastors are trying to find they're members who said 10 years ago, I've served God with all my whole heart. 
you can't get in the car no more. Yes. It's exhausting because pastors have social media too. And we see you at the mall. We see you at the concert. We see you everywhere living your best life. And we say, I ain't seen you in church. I, I'm just, I need to be safe. <laughs> it's exhausting trying to find out and manage and trying to preach truth while people are trying to pull your message into their own context and misrepresent and misinterpret what you are saying. It's exhausting. And I watched churches that had their foundation in whatever you want to call it, Holy Ghost, Pentecostal, on fire movement, get so exhausted that they find themselves up under a juniper tree just hanging out. And the Bible says that the angel touches him. You know the story. Makes him food. Now you know you're exhausted when an angel shows up. <laughs> You wake up and see an angel. You wake up and see an angel. Almost every time when an angel appears in the Bible, first thing they say is, fear not. Right? By the time you said fear not, it's too late. <laughs> when you said fear, I, I'm already scared. Because when angels show up, they just, you know, you're not ready for all that. This is one of the few places in the Bible, an angel shows up and Elijah's like this. An angel is cooking. <laughs> Elijah eats the food. You know you're exhausted when you can't stay awake for a conversation with the angel. You ate it and went straight back to sleep. That's exhausted. And now he goes back to sleep. Angel makes him some more food. Listen to what he says. Arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. Here's this problem. Watch this now. Elijah, when he left, left his servant in Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. You're going to catch this in a minute, and I'm going to quit. He left his servant in Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. The purpose of his servant was not to, just to carry bags and open doors and pour water. The purpose of his servant was to remind him why he was alive. The problem that we have and that what isolation does to us is we go alone. And the Bible said he himself went alone, but he left his servant whose ministry was to remind him why he was breathing. When you are separated from people who are called to you, the only voice you hear is your own and or the enemies. Can you imagine what would have happened if Elijah would have said out loud, in the presence of his servant, what he just said to God. If, he, if his servant would have heard him say, I've had enough, I'm ready to die. His servant's ministry would have kicked in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he would have said, oh my goodness, Elijah, you are the, I ain't never seen nothing in my life. Never has anybody even heard of what you just did. Oh my goodness, the way you did that, you poured that water out there, poop, fire came down. Oh my, they gonna talk about it. They gonna talk about you for years. I ain't never in my life, they gonna write songs about it. They gonna get t-shirts, fire callers, t-shirts. They gonna have fire conferences. They gonna have everything. Never in my, his, he would have caught, he would call it, but he went alone. He went alone. And when he went alone, Angel says, arise and eat. I'm coming to my end here because this food situation with Elijah is intriguing to me because you can track his life through the food he's eating. <laughs> so 
He calls, he calls for no rain, but then he goes and he's sustained by the river Cherith. And that, that being sustained by that river gets him to Zarephath. And he goes on the strength of her food back to Jezebel. And now he goes in the wilderness, and now he's getting more food. But there's a difference. Watch me. The angel says, arise and eat, because the journey, watch it, the journey is too great for you. The journey is too great for you. The previous times, Elijah's food had to do with what had just happened, and now he's eating food for what's about to happen. And some point in our lives, we have to get tired of eating food to help us recover over what had happened and start eating some future food for where we're about ready to go. And it's okay to take time to get over it. Get over it. Talk it out. Cry it out. Call somebody. Do something. Whatever. But sooner or later, you're going to find out that you, when God is getting ready to shift your level, that your taste changes. And I've lost my taste for criticism. I've lost my taste for you fighting with other believers. I've lost my taste with you just rehearsing and circling the wagons because I'm going someplace now that's going to require everything that I've got and I don't have time to be eating yesterday's manna. I've got to have a prophetic word coming into my life and coming into my mouth. Somebody clap your hands and say yes. Come on, clap your hands and say yes. I believe as I was getting ready to come to be with you that I was reminded that this church was born in the fire. This church was born and built on a foundation. This church has stood for the integrity of the Word of God, the blood of Jesus, uh, the baptism of the saints, uh, communion, tithing, Holy Ghost, cast out devils. This church has stood for it. And now we are at a pivotal moment when I am watching the enemy talk churches out of their position. And they're too busy trying to get by. They're too busy eating at Jezebel's table because she's making life easy for them. But I heard the Lord say that the spirit of Elijah is coming into the house of God and is getting ready to go after some spirits and bring down some powers. I want to know if anybody in this building got the Holy Ghost. I believe that the generation that they are calling the doomers uh, are now being called into a place. I believe that we must refine our voice. Uh, we go ha be having to willing to upset you and your cousin every so often uh, because we got to stand up here and we got to call it like it is. Uh, we got to stand up and confront the powers uh, of Ahab and Jezebel that are ruling over a generation and tell them you foul, unclean, lying spirit, you are coming down in the name of Jesus. I don't know how you feel, but I'm going to tell you that I can't get by on some watered down message, some kind of little life skill telling me how to put my shopping cart back and smile at my neighbor. I need somebody to stir something on the inside of me and to call to the power of God that is on the inside of me and to speak to the principalities and powers of a territory. I came here on your 68th anniversary, the last speaker of the month, to say to you, get up and eat because this journey is too great for you. Somebody stand up and clap your hands. Come on. I think there has to be a collective yes. I think there has to be a collective amen. I think there has to be a group 
thinking mentality as it relates to this concept uh, that we need to clear some space in the atmosphere and remind the devil that Evangel Church is here. And we're not like everybody else. We ain't against everybody else, but we ain't like everybody else. We came here and we, yes, don't join up with us uh, if you can't handle the controversy. Don't join up with us if you can't handle a little drama because we came here to displace uh, governing powers over the spirit of our generation. And we're coming with a sword and we're coming with the word of God and we get ready to call down fire and another generation is coming into the house of God. Come on, everybody, one time, clap your hands. Come on, just clap your hands. I got I to gotta get out your way. I just want you to clap. I want you to make some noise. I want you to make some noise that sound like we're winning. I want you to believe God that we're winning something in this day. I believe, just stand there with you if you will, just stand there with me if you will, and I believe right now that the Spirit of God is coming, and it was my purpose, my purpose to come, and submit this word, of course, to the apostle of the house, but to say in your hearing that there is a reason, come, 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 that there is a reason that Evangel Temple is here. There's a reason that God has walked you and preserved you and been with you and sometimes by a river and sometimes by widow women and sometimes fighting principalities. There's a reason that God brought you here and that the purpose of the enemy over the last season was to wear you down so he could knock you out. But if you can receive it, the angel of the Lord is coming to feed you and say, get up, get up and eat. Get up and eat because we're getting ready to go on a journey. We're getting ready to go on a journey. And I believe the collective yes and amen and the collective claps and the collective yes and the collective all of I believe the collective that is cre creates the space because I believe that the church needs to say to our leadership and to say to our apostles and to say to the preachers and to say to the elders, open up your mouth and come with us because people of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we need to hear words from the Lord. And we thank God that so many words have come through this, this man of God the people of God that serve here. But I'm telling you, I just want to put a collective yes in the air and let them know, open up your mouth and let God use you because where we're going, we can't get by on what used to be done. We can't get by on just yesterday's manna. We can't get by on just little, little sermonettes for Christianettes. We can open up your mouth and let the Lord God speak into this territory. And if you will give a collective yes and amen, come on, clap your hands, everybody. Clap your hands, everybody. Clap your hands, everybody. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And I believe that we are in defining moments. I believe we're in defining seasons. I believe that we're in a moment when things have to move for you and things have to begin to shift. And I've been, I've been praying and been declaring that now as we stand here, that from now until the end of this year, that things are going to begin to move for the people of God. And things that have held you up for too long are beginning to move out of your way. Who will take that word right there? Who will take it? Who will just say, I'm going to snatch that thing. It's been a long season where things have been unresolved. But God is about ready to turn something. How many of you have a sensing in your heart that God is turning something for you? If you know he's turning it, just go ahead and just turn around one time. Just turn around one time and believe that God is turning it around for you. One more time, say yes and clap your hands. I feel it. I feel it. I feel something moving for our churches. I feel something moving for Holy Ghost people. I feel something moving for people that have been tired. I feel like God is turning it and moving it in your favor. Say yes. Because of your financial contributions, Evangel Cathedral is able to spread the gospel to so many people within our surrounding community and world. For your convenience, we've made it easy for you to donate online or by phone. To give online, go to evangelcathedral.net. Click on Give. You can give a one-time donation or set up recurring donations. 
You also have the option to give your tithes to the building fund, seed offering, missions, or to Revival and Evangel. You can also give via text messaging. To begin using this texting option, text Evangel Cathedral to 77977 to receive a link. With PushPay, there's no need to remember a username and password to log in. You can verify your identity using your mobile phone number. You are also able to sew via the Cash App. After you've downloaded the app and created an account, tap the Balance tab on your Cash App home screen. Select Add Bank or Add Credit Card and follow the prompts. To give, enter the amount you would like to pay. Tap Pay. Enter our Cash Tag dollar sign Evangel Cathedral. Remember to include your first and last name for records. Enter what the payment is for and tap pay. We would like to encourage you to consider electronic giving as a more convenient and organized way to give. Thank you for your generosity to our ministry and the kingdom as we continue to spread the love of Jesus Christ.